Hello everyone and welcome to another virtual program with the National Portrait Gallery. My name's Jill and I am very lucky to work with the digital team here at the National Portrait Gallery. We have a cast of thousands bringing this production to you today. No, just kidding. We have like a handful of people. But we do have um, Steph on Facebook. If you're joining us live on Facebook, she's going to be looking after your comments and your questions in there today. And Matt is joining us in the Zoom chat. So everybody knows Matt from our uh, Tuesday and Thursday programs. And we have Hector and Robert behind the scenes doing working their digital magic. So we do love interactivity with our programs. I'm sure those of you have joined us before and I can see quite a few familiar faces coming through the Zoom door today. If you've, um, we do love our programs to be interactive. So if you have any questions or comments or observations throughout the program, please pop them into the chat section on Zoom or uh, shoot them along in the Facebook comments and we'll do our best to get some of those questions through to our presenters today. Um, it's very uh, fitting that uh, on, for a program considering representation for First Nations people in the Portrait Gallery collection that I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the National Portrait Gallery sits, the beautiful lands here in Canberra of the Nambri and Ngunnawal peoples. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, as well as extending a very warm welcome to any of the First Nations people who may be joining us for this program today. Now. This morning, I actually came into the National Portrait Gallery. Uh, how exciting. We are getting very busy to reopen our doors this Friday, the 29th of October, um, after some time in lockdown. I uh, am actually not sitting in the gallery space at the moment, although I could be, given that there's no public here at the moment. I am sitting in the digital studio um, downstairs. So a little virtual background here, a little smoke and mirrors. But I was also super excited to see some faces that I had not seen for a very long time, some of my dear colleagues here at the Portrait Gallery, but also meet new staff who I have only ever met on Zoom. And one of those staff members has very kindly agreed to come on for this program today, Rebecca Ray, our associate curator, who is uh, hot off the press from the Gold Coast, literally only just sort of arrived in the middle of lockdown and we were, I was really excited to be able to meet her in person today. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sandra Bruce, our Director of Collections and Exhibitions, to introduce Rebecca to you all, our wonderful virtual online community. Thanks, Sandra. Thanks, Jill, uh, for your warm welcome, as always. It's much appreciated. And um, it's been great over the last month or so getting to know you, Rebecca, as a new member of the team. And we're so lucky you were even able to arrive in Canberra last month, September, when you hit hit our borders. And I hope, um, regardless of doing most things over Zoom, that you feel like you're settling in with us here at the National Portrait Gallery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we're going to have an interesting chat today, I think. Um, it's, it's a pretty um, intense topic. There are so many areas and uh, um, spaces that we can talk about when we talk about considering representation within our genre, and so probably today, or we're uh, what we're really going to be do is, uh, doing is is sort of touching on a few points that we really hope might spur conversation and more more thinking space for people, and it and it could, I guess, very well set the stage for us to have um, more uh, specific conversations further on down the track, which would be really great. Um, so I guess to get the ball rolling, let's talk about the portrait gallery and. Let's talk about what, what our genre is, what portraiture is. I mean, it comes from a very, the way we approach it at the National Portrait Gallery, it comes from a very Western, Western tradition of uh, representation where it's about um, being able to recognise, ideally, um, the people that you're looking at and get a, and get a sense of who those people are by, um, by looking at their human faces. And that's our way into their stories, if you like. And so the National Portrait Gallery, uh, which has been around for a few decades now, is, is very much built on that tradition. But I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to explore uh, what, what Australia is, what Australians are through um, an evolving sense of what the art form of portraiture could be so I look forward to us having a chat about that today too but do you know what I think 
first up, let's have a little bit of a talk about you, Rebecca. You're a you're a curator. You've been in our sector, in the gallery and museum sector, for a few years now. And so it'd be great if um, you could talk a little bit about what that experience has been for you um, so far. Yeah. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, but yeah, just before I start as well, um, I would just like to pay my respects um, to elders past, present and emerging here um, and that we're here today on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. Um, it's really exciting to be here. Um, but yeah, um, as Sandra and Idril said, uh, I'm Rebecca. I, my lineage uh, is up in the Torres Strait in the Eastern Islands um, and I have connection over through in Mabiag as well. Um, but yeah, as, as a curator in the, in the sector for a couple of years now, um, it's, it's so important to have the, the presence and visibility of First Nations people in these spaces, you know, because for such a long time, like there's been this history, um, it's been quite problematic and, and contentious relationships with First Nations people, particularly around like, yeah, the collection um, and exhibition styles and display of um, Indigenous material culture or visual culture. Um, and, you know, like historically institutions have been those sort of places of knowledge and based on power structures. So, you know, um, these identities and cultures has been collected and interpreted and described through these Western colonial lenses. So being, and, and a lot of the time, like um, Indigenous people weren't actually ever inside of these institutions or represented correctly. They've mm. always been seen through that colonial lens or a Western dominant lens. Um, so a lot of those uh, perspectives and, and knowledges are just have not been visible, you know, or represented. Um, so yeah, um, being able to actually be inside of it and be within the and sort of um, contribute to the ongoing, um, I guess, decolonization or re-indigenization of, of these spaces is so important um, for, you know, cultural autonomy, um, acknowledgement, representation, um, and cultural continuum, continuity, I, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's inter yeah, I mean, it's, I think that there's more and more of an awareness around this um, over the last few years, and I hope that that just continues to grow because um, I guess the, the the white Western voice might be the biggest voice in Australia, but it's not the only voice, and we absolutely have to acknowledge and make room for um, uh, the, the broad experiences and the broad cultures and the broad histories of that lives in this country. And, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Like... Um... That, yeah, there's a lot of stories within Australia, um, you know, that like the cultural, colonial, historical stories, and they all contribute to our contemporary society. So all of them need to have a voice and all of them need to have a representation um, as we continue. Yeah. I think we're, we're using our, our collection at the Portrait Gallery to illustrate some of the touch points today. And I think you've brought together a bit of a selection of subjects in our collection that speak to First Nations presence in the creative sectors. Yeah, yep, yep. No, that's right. Um, so I've sort of picked a few works uh, and people that I think have had, you know, uh, major contributions to like community um, and country, but then also uh, broadly into the art sector as well that have sort of paved the way for, for me to be able to be in these spaces, you know, like the, these long legacies of, um, advocates, educators, activists, artists, curators, um, and everything um, that, yeah, have, have, you know, really started that journey to, to be able to have, yeah, these spaces and, and to normalise, like, our presence and visibility. Yeah. So, Hector, if you haven't already, could you bring up the first slide? It's a Michael Riley photograph there. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. It's this is from a series that he created back in the mid-'80s and into the early-'90s. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I, yeah, I I chose these works um, exactly because they're they're such a beautiful collection, and this is yeah, beautiful Quandamukul quail. Um, and you know, both Michael and Avril are incredible artists and activists and advocates and educators of culture. Um, but you know, really paramount and and establishing like a, a, I would say like an urban voice of Aboriginal people. Um, you know, with the 1985 and Redfern and, and yeah really sort of putting like really challenging the notion of, of what an Aboriginal person is or who they are um, and, and where they're located within Australia I would say and, and really to share that diversity um, 
Mm. Yeah, and it really put urban artists as well on the map in, in that sense, I would say. Yeah, so there was there was that real movement in Sydney in that period, wasn't there, in the Redfern area? Yeah. A, a real locus for First Nations creatives? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the artists that came out of that have really, like, honestly, that like, paved the way for, for um, you know, contemporary urban artists to, to have representation. Um, and it's that sort of rereading and retelling of, of history um, mm. and identity. And, yeah. 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 So what was the, uh, oh, look at that. Yeah, that close-up's really extraordinary. I mean, the, I think one thing that really captures me about Michael's, uh, Riley's work from, from that fine art perspective is his use of um, light and shadow and the yeah. drama, you know, the drama that he pushes into this suite of works is 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 just um, almost heart-stopping, I guess, is a yeah, way. Yeah, so it's powerful, like, absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and this could be seen as um, um, very much embracing creative contemporary output um, and, and using, using the resources of, you know, the photographic medium, I suppose, to, to capture his, his stories and, and his, um, the people that he surrounded himself with those stories as well. Yeah, it's almost sort of like reclaiming um, photography in a sense for, for yeah. First Nations people. Yeah. Um, considering that yeah photography can, can you can look back historically and see it as sort of like a colonial vehicle um mm -hmm. in a sense to yeah yeah was there another one of riley's work? yeah um i just had hetty perkins was the next one um yeah you know just mm. another really great example of, of of photography um but also the way that you know hetty is such a, a massive legacy in, in advocacy and education and curatorial work you know, that um, it's all just really about reclaiming that autonomy and cultural identity and sort of that true representation of who people are. Yeah, and and I think um, looking back, this, this is really looking back. I mean, um, some of us are older than others and, and uh, 1990 doesn't feel that long ago to me necessarily, but let's face it, it was 30 years ago and, you know, Hetty's um, space is is one that um, she carved out for herself and it's a really critical one and um, I think um, she's a very recognisable figure in our sector today. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Really. Yeah. It's beautiful work. It really is. I think um, we, we touched on it a little bit um, briefly, you know, the notion of uh, colonial representation of First Nations people and, and, you know, we were talking about it in the context of photography particularly, but our collection does have um, a number of works from the colonial eras of Australia, so the 1800s particularly, and there is representation of Indigenous peoples in those, but um, today we've decided we're not going to show any of those, haven't we, because what we really want to focus on today is self-representation and um, and the contemporary representation of First Nations people, and not necessarily we didn't really want to today play in that space of of that sort of ethnographical view, that anthropological yeah. colonial um, othering that is is pretty much where where that representation came from. Uh, again, it's it's a big conversation, and and we might decide we might make room for that. Uh, later on down the track as we develop these sorts of um, talking series. But today, I think it's really great to focus on the now, I guess, and, and our more recent um, history that's gotten us to this point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, the 18th and 19th centuries are, are, are like such a huge topic um, in terms of, you know, um, history and within Australia particularly as well, mm. um, you know, they're all just about really recording First Nations people um, without really any considerations of their cultural connections or relationships um, or belief systems. Um, mm. And, you know, yeah, these types of portraits were used as archival material in journals um, and explorer kind of situations. But, mm. yeah, I'm very much um, interested in looking at the, at the way that we can reclaim those spaces um, and, and use, you know, so an acknowledgement rather than um you know it's a very important history as well um but mm -hmm. yeah today i just would, yeah love to focus on um sort of the contemporary works that are coming in and how we can um be re-represented and rewrite a story or retell the story rather 
yeah 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 and um yeah own it I suppose yeah yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. 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 so before before we go there I think one juxtaposition that's very interesting and is almost like a sort of a a, a linkage between uh, um, the Western the Western um, primacy of 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 creative output in Australia and then pushing pushing over into um, self representation. We've got a juxtaposition which is uh, white artists or, or non Indigenous representing Indigenous subjects. And um, there is a rather, uh, a, a quite a well-known relationship from the middle of last century, so the middle of the 1900s, which was between a white, a, a pretty um, high-profile white Australian artist, William Dargie, and um, another artist who became quite a good friend of his, I think, Albert Namatjira. And we have a portrait of Namatjira by Dargie in the collection from 56. Yeah, yeah, I think um, a lot of people would be absolutely familiar with these works by um, Sir William Dargie about um, Albert Namajira. Um, but yeah, I think what you just touched on, Sandra, was um, more of that relationship that was being built um, and that friendship that sort of happened. And while it is still under a white gaze um, and, you know, not a self-portrait or anything like that, there, there still seems there's a shift away from obviously that ethnographic where there is no othering in a sense. Well, yeah, that there's just not that archival kind of photography or portraiture that's happening here. There's there's a connection um, that's that's happening, and it's that relationship between sitter and um, artist. Um, you know that portraiture is really based on as well. Um, you know, and like I see this work, and there's there's like dignity in Nemajira's face, and it's sort of that that point where um, you know Indigenous people became a bit more within the media in terms of like fine art and, and representation, um, you know, and, and we can see he's in the backdrop of his country, but he's also holding a bit of his own work and, you know, and, and Namajira's work has been so um, paramount in like art history and Australian art history as well. So, yeah, I think it's a good example of, you know, there can be these relationships and connections between um, non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people within the art world, you know, like there can be very beautiful connections and relationships that can happen and be like read these respectful ones. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was thinking of the word respect as you were talking about those relationships and it's, it's you know, it's, I think we all operate under the assumption that that's at the heart of any healthy relationship is respect, but sometimes there's nothing wrong with being really overt about that and just putting it right out there as being, being that important. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, yeah, definitely do agree with that. Yeah. I mean, this tradition has continued um, for years, you know, artists painting artists. It's something that we generally, it, it's not surprising that that happens. Um, if someone wants a subject, they'll um, hit up uh, someone they know potentially to, uh, <laughs> to sit for yeah. them. And I think we've got a, a much more contemporary example of that in the next, in the next work, Hector which is a portrait by the, uh, I think he's Sydney-based artist, Jasper Knight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, again, another, this one's, yeah, very different to um, the Jira work. Um, but, again, like it's still um, a white artist. Um, yeah, so Jasper. And then you've got Reco Rennie, um, the Indigenous artist. Um, and I think what was interesting about this work is sort of there, there still is that relationship, but it seems to be more in that kind of, um the way that each artist works um in terms of you know that street art and bold, bright bold colors and you know you can and you know Reiko has like a huge um part where he, where he uses um he unpacks his like urban identity um you know in, in the contemporary environments as, as as where he lives um you know and he's combining symbols of his his Camilleroy culture um, with elements of that graffiti and street art to interrogate like his identity as an urban Indigenous artist. Um, and I think like with Jasper's work, it, it does come through in that, like um, through the use of like spray paint. And then there's all those elements that touch on, you know, the street signs in the backgrounds, um, the bold colours. And then you've also got that sort of tag of Reiko on the side that's yeah. very graffiti-esque, you know, um, but like, he's still a very dominant figure in this. Like he's not in the background um, and he's not, he like, he is the subject. Yeah. Um, 
and the artist. So he's, uh, sorry, not the artist yet. Like he is the subject, but um, yeah, he's not a passive body in this. Um, so he, it's quite dominating um, and it speaks to his identity about that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so these uh, these two works, um, Dagi's Namajira and um, Knight's Rennie, they're sixty odd years apart, but there's a very similar conjunction happening between artist and sitter, where um, the artist is acknowledging the style of the sitter because it's one that's that's also um, embraced by them. Yeah. Um, I think, and I think it does speak again, to, as you say, to that to that sort of an honesty one would hope, within the relationship between the two individuals because I think the best portraits are going to be ones where it's almost a collaboration between the artist and yes. the sitter and the artist is trying to pull, they're using their creative lens or their, in this instance, their creative spray can, maybe your brush, to, um, to pull out elements of the sitter for us to help us get a bit more of an understanding about who we're looking at. Yeah, no, definitely There's that collaboration. Um, yeah, yeah, there needs to be a collaboration and a relationship that occurs um, for it to be a really good work, I think, um, portraiture, yeah. Yeah. So then we do move into um, representation of Indigenous people by Indigenous people. So we went there, we went there with Michael Riley's suite from, from the 80s and 90s, but if we, if we fast forward a, a little bit, um, one thing that the portrait gallery that we have in our remit is to co commission contemporary portraiture, to uh, target um, a significant person that has been important to how Australia has and is evolving, and then align them with an artist at, to ideally present something absolutely beautiful and amazing. And one that we did uh, a little over 10 years ago now was of uh, the extraordinary Marsha Langton. Yeah, yeah. Um, if we go to the, yeah, I I really love this work. I think it's super awesome and super cool. Um, but I think it really, um, it pushes the boundaries so much of what that idea of traditional portraiture is. Yeah. Um, you know, and it really reflects on the, the sort of diverse spiritual and cultural um, experiences of people. Um, you know, like in this work, Marcia is, you know, she's portrayed as like, uh, herself and, and as or as an indigenous person but you know it's a series of dynamic flowing um events I suppose rather than just sort of like this racialized perception of an indigenous person as well which mm -hmm. I think is really cool um and you know it speaks about so many different parts of Marcy as a person um mm -hmm. both in a private and professional um persona I guess mm -hmm. and then touching back on what we were just speaking about in terms of that collaboration, you can, you can really can see that collaboration between Brooke Andrews um, and Marcia between um, both of the really things that are important to them um, have, are coming through in this, in this screen printed collage, you know, with the diamond cut that's from Brooke's cultural heritage. Um, yeah. And then we've also got like the beliefs, um, you know, the private beliefs that Marcia has with, and, and then like in, in interest, interested in Hinduism and Buddhism, um, you yeah. know, um, but yeah. also fused with like her Aboriginal um, beliefs as well, you know, oh. um, and there's that really great fus fusing of that. But we also see like all these elements that a lot of people know Marcia for, like, you know, she's a really, um, you know, renowned Indigenous anthropologist um, and yeah. she's done so much work as well around like, traditional fire management um, and fire use in Aboriginal communities, but also, um, you know, and, and mining industries and everything. Oh. So, and, you know, that's where we can see the diamond cut comes back in through. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, it's a really, really important work um, because it's, it, yeah, really pushes past what people would think portraiture is. I guess. Exactly. Yeah, and it's and it's monumental. I mean, in your yeah, where you're huge. sitting, uh, Rebecca, with your backdrop today, you can get a sense of the scale of it, and it's it's got an extraordinary presence when you when you're with it in the gallery spaces. And I love that. Um, oh, and I, I must apologise to our audience. We can fix this um, for the version of this chat that will live on our website. But we've and and I'll apologise to Marsha if she sees this. But we've actually spelled her name wrong in the in the 
in the credit line for this work. I'm so sorry, we mixed up a couple of letters there, but it is Marsha Langton. Um, and uh, like I say, we can hopefully fix that for the um, permanent record on our website. Um, but yeah, when it comes to when it comes to representation and, and and in our genre, so thinking about what portraiture is, that that's one of the reasons why this is such an amazing work. It, it really does broaden people's expectations of what they might possibly see um, when it comes to learning about someone through through that person's portrait, because it's not traditional, but it is still very much the subject. It is still very much Marsha Langton. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think we're going to go back in time a little bit again for the next one, aren't we, uh, yeah. Rebecca? Yeah, with Tracy Moffat's work. Oh, no, oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry. That was my mistake. I apologise, Rebecca. We've got um, we've got uh, Auntie Matilda House by Brenda Elcroft. Yeah, no, that's fine. Also just a stunning work. I actually really love this work of, mm -hmm. yeah, um, Dr. Auntie Matilda House um, by Brenda Elcroft. Um, yeah. It's quite large too. It's a, quite a powerful work um, in real life as well, like when you see it. Um, but yeah, Ani Matilda, she's a she's a Nambri woman, so she's from this area, um, you know. And she dedicated her life to social justice for Indigenous people, and was like paramount in the tent embassy um, in Aboriginal like legal services, I think in Quimbian. Mm -hmm. um, and she was the first Indigenous person to perform um, "Welcome to Country." Um, you know, and plus she's had so many other immense contrib contributions to community that reach both locally, but also like quite far um, across yeah. Australia, you know. Um, but, you know, and Brenda Elcroft as well is quite an amazing person too, um, an activist, a curator, an academic, so many fierce contributions to community. And yeah. I think what's so great about this work is that, that it captures um, Arnie Matilda in such a, a powerful and dignified and, and like quite knowledgeable, you know, um, mm. state. And, you know, I, you can see that there's like this relationship as well between Brenda and Arnie Matilda that, that's occurring, you know, um, and the, the, the respect that's coming from this. Um, you can just see so much knowledge um, in the eyes, I think. Um, that, and it moves every time, like I really love yeah. it. Like yeah. it's so powerful. Yeah, she's, and she, um, we've both been very fortunate to meet Auntie Matilda and um, she's a very strong woman and uh, that comes through absolutely in this portrait. It's it's a quiet strength, but it's there, you know. Yeah. It, there's a bedrock to Auntie Matilda, I think. It's just, it's so matriarchal as well. Like, it's just, mm. yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. And this, um, um, Croft, Brenda Croft, L. Croft, the, um, yeah, photographer, curator, activist, um, again, local to us. So, again, we're very fortunate to be able to touch base with another strong woman here in Canberra. Um, this is part of a series, this work, that she was working on, which all came around, uh, stemmed from an idea around um, acknowledging the um, legacy of uh, Barangaroo through capturing portraits of contemporary First Nations women in a series that I guess pays homage to to Barangaroo's legacy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I need to keep an eye on the time, don't I, Rebecca <laughs> and Jill? Why don't we move on to the next one, which is now this is where we go back in yeah. time. Let's have a so look at one of Tracy. the amazing Tracy Moffat's works. Yeah. Um, I also love this work. I picked works that I just really love, it seems like. <laughs> uh, it's one of um, one of the it's one of the benefits of being a curator, I think, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got the movie star um, and this of David. Yeah, it's so, so many things I think are happening in this. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that you could unpack in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's so sort of tongue in cheek as well um, because like, like David is actually like a full on movie star and he had like a career spanning um, something like 40 years, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. But then you know, but also the idea of an app is not really something that comes to, like, popular thought, I suppose. Oh. Um, you know, it's not in our media as much as um, sort of those white movie stars or whatever. Um, but also I think, you know, he's he's at the beach and he's got a boom box and he's having a beer with his boardies on. Um, 
you know, but also that itself falls outside of our popular conception of perception of Indigenous people. Like mm. you, people always, I would think that like um, have this idea of Indigenous people sort of, you know, belonging in the desert or almost even in a time frame, um, mm. you know, and, and in that real temporal and spatial state. I think it's really quite a bit, uh, yeah, like like it's really challenging and subverting like the Australian national kind of character, um, you know, because it's referencing colonialism and dispossession um, and I suppose um, Indigenous visibility, you know, like. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean. <laughs> and there are movie stars. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Gulp Lil, abso- yeah, an amazing, an amazing actor, absolutely um cast in very uh, stereotypical roles um, for, for an Aboriginal man. Um, but here he is ensconced in um, seaside popular culture of the 80s. Um, and so it's taking, because even as a movie star, he wasn't necessarily, um, um, or he hasn't necessarily, he uh, he hasn't necessarily been considered to be anything outside of how we view him on the screen. Like yeah. you say, as opposed to white movie stars where we expect to see him down the street having a cup of coffee and getting snapped by the pepper yeah. or that kind of thing. Yeah, so um, I think Tracy Moffat as a photographer and a, and, a, and a social documentarian, she's been very canny in capturing these um, um, disconnections, I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, definitely. Mm. Mm. Um, let me see. Oh, okay. So we've, we've looked a lot at um, um, essentially today what we've looked at so far is very much around the Western tradition of portraiture. We've looked at photographic portraiture. We've looked at painted portraits. Um, um, the Brooke Andrew of Marsha Langton is about as uh, outside of that box as we've gotten. Yeah. Um, but why don't we move into something that is probably even more unexpected and let's look at the Herman, Hermansburg pot. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the potter's portrait pot. Um, and, yeah, this was, um, uh, yeah, Hermansburg potters. Um, and it's the collective, sorry, it's a collaboration. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah, collaboration with <laughs> yeah. the senior women um, out in Hermansburg. Um but yeah, it, it's you know, it's not two D. Number one, it's a it's a sculptural work, um, mm. and it's and it's a self portrait. It's a self identity work, mm. um, and you know, we were talking a lot about Western portraiture, and it's usually around the likeness or the um, you know the physical features of a person. Um, whereas you know, in in Indigenous portraiture, um, you know, it doesn't really necessarily have to follow the convention of depicting just the face. Um, or even to have that physical likeness um, because it's more can can sometimes be about like revealing a person's identity I guess um, in relation to each other in your community Mm -hmm. um, to the land and then also to you know the creation ancestors and spiritual beliefs Um, and I think this work really sort of speaks to that because it's talking so much about um, you know the, the the women's connection to country and you can see that all around the pot um you know depiction of land um all the animals and birds the wildlife the yeah. all the all the flowers and rocks and everything and everything having a place and being you know um themselves is almost an extension of the land um yeah it's a really beautiful work and then it's also talking about you know they've got the watercolor through it and they're quite well known for their work in pottery um and watercolors in Hermansburg so um yeah 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 and it's um it's it's I don't know if many of our audience are familiar with the with um what this collective at Hermansburg do around around this particular space but I've seen them do these amazing pots of that include um portraits of um footy players and that kind of thing as well which is fantastic but I'm so glad that when when we um requested that they might be willing to do a just for us at the portrait gallery that it was the self-portrait that the uh, elder women um, have presented to us because it um, it's it's a it's a it's a national recognition of the of the significance of these women and what they've contributed to our artistic our contemporary artistic history through telling their own stories yeah yeah mm. 
Mm. Definitely. There's mm. really, yeah, that existence in country is yeah. like so inseparable um, in community and for Indigenous people. And I think that really comes through in this work, in this self-portrait. Mm. Yeah. Um, I'll jump in with a couple of comments um, from yeah. the audience, if that's okay. Of course um, it's okay. I, I well, first a comment from me, Rebecca, you, you a really lovely phrase just now um, when you were describing the potter's pot where you said it was a self-identity work as opposed to a self, well, not as opposed to, but as well as a self-portrait. And I think that's just such a lovely phrase. And maybe we could petition our um, our board to change our ga gallery <laughs> name to the self-identity gallery instead of <laughs> the gallery, identity gallery instead of the portrait gallery. But it just seems to be such a, and it's something that we do try here at the Portrait Gallery is to kind of upset that traditional notion of what a portrait might be. And we often do throw around that word identity, which seems to be a little bit freer, perhaps, from some of those, that baggage that perhaps the word portrait contains. Yeah, no, I do agree. Yeah, identity, because it encompasses so much more um, than what we think of portraiture. You know, it can be cultural, it can be historical, it can be social identities. But, yeah, so a self-identity um, yeah, it's it's a good word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you'll get. We'll make sure that um, Rebecca gets credit for that if yeah, we okay, end cool. up the National <laughs> Identity Gallery, Jill. But <laughs> thanks for putting that one out there. Um, I think we do have a few minutes left, don't we, Jill? If there are any other comments or questions um, from our audience today, there's been a lot of actually a lot of engagement with the the topic that you've been talking about today. But Ruby you mentioned earlier when we were speaking about photography, um, the role of that Mervyn Bishop has played as as a photographer, and we do have quite a few portraits by Mervyn Bishop in the collection. So she just wanted to to note his contribution and that he'd spoken recently, I think, at the NFSA um, with Hetty about Hetty Perkins about one of his his portraits. Yes, there's a, there's been a beautiful uh, touring exhibition out of the Art Gallery of New South Wales that the National Sound and Film Archive, which is the NSFA, um, took on in Canberra. And uh, I was lucky enough to get over there and uh, have a sneaky look at that before lockdown. And it, it was a beautiful exhibition that really didn't just celebrate Mervyn's uh, photographic contributions, but also talked about his life and where he came from too. It was really a beautiful exhibition. Yeah, a lot of contributions there. Yeah, we've yeah. got a big collection of his work too, don't we? We do, yeah, yeah. including the famous one. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, here we go. Which which <laughs> Prime Minister was it? Gough Whitlam? Gough Whitlam, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we also had a um, question from Vladimir yeah, to Rebecca, wondering, Rebecca, is there a particular person that you'd like to see um, uh, have a portrait in our collection? Is there anyone that comes to mind that we don't currently have? Oh, there's probably a, lots. Probably a <laughs> lot. Yeah. No, there's a lot of people. Um, oh, that's a really tough one. Um, Just between uh, you, me, and the um, well, the audience. <laughs> that may or may not have finished, and we had to ask Rebecca in the interview. But um, <laughs> and again. <laughs> And I feel like I got asked the same question too. It's a really tough one to answer because there are so many amazing things in Australia at the moment. Yeah. I, I like the idea of um, bringing maybe some younger faces in, Rebecca, if there's anyone that sparks you in, in the latest up-and-comers. Yeah, I um, maybe someone like with a music background I think would be awesome. Um, yeah, um, because the contribution of music... Um, you know, within Australia and culture and everything is so important. Um, yeah, I look at all, like, people that are, like, reclaim language through song um, and they're out there um, on, like, sort of, like, national or international levels now that can speak, speak language and sing it um, is so important. So, yeah, maybe someone in the music field um, I think would be cool to have a portrait of. Hmm. We've got um, your virtual background there with uh, Gurumul behind you as well, Rebecca. So yeah. <laughs> a, a classic one of people reclaiming language through song. But that could be a whole exhibition in and of itself, actually, indigenous yeah. song makers and music makers. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, since Rebecca's come on board with us here, um, we've put her to work. And... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, including doing some writing um, for our next edition of Portrait Mag. Yes. Um, do you want to talk just a little bit about the article that you've been working on, Rebecca? Yeah, so I've been um, 
working sort of with these beautiful photographs um, by Jacob Nash, um, who's the creative head of Bangara um, Indigenous Dance. Um, so it's been really nice to be able to talk with him and interview him about the works, but it's sort of really looking at um, the paint up room and the use of ochre in dance um, and the way that ochre um, has a transformation property um, into a spiritual sense for dancers. And, and Jacob's really captured these really strong images of these dancers. Um, and they're so powerful because they've become from, from people into, they've transformed into um, this almost sacred realm of being storyteller, of being um, as dancers, as cultural dancers like that. That Yeah, so that's sort of the article. And it's just, yeah, the really lovely interview with Jacob um, and about the importance of dance and culture um, and, and, yeah, Oka. Yeah. And I think I think I'm I'm go, I'm fascinated to read it and then see see the suite of works once the magazine's published. Maybe I'll get a sneak peek. But um, <laughs> I think I think this is one of the exciting things about our genre. I mean, portraiture is um, at face value quite could be considered quite narrow, a, a narrow sort of niche space within visual arts practice uh, in contemporary art. But having said that, it's a conjunction of so many things. It's a conjunction of History, story, narrative, identity, and and then and then through through the visual creative lens, and so that's where we get to have these exciting and really um, engrossing opportunities to explore people like like the Jacob Nash story that you'll be doing for the magazine. Yeah, um, there's definitely so much room to push boundaries of like what what people consider to be quite a narrow field. Mm. Definitely. Um, yeah, there's so many stories yeah. that can be told. Yeah. And that's why we knew that with only 45 minutes today, we'd barely be able to, you know, we, we could <laughs> sort of we could sort of skim along the surface like we're skipping stones. But really what we're hoping to set up for ourselves is is a platform from which we can really start to dive into some of these topics and have some really um, intense and 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 um, hopefully um, uh, interesting and useful conversations going forward. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Mm. We've almost had that exact comment from one of the members of our Zoom audience today from Tony, who is asking us to please continue these once things return to some sense of normalcy, because the conversations are so important to be had. And it really means that people can, um, from around Australia and indeed around the world, can access to these kind of conversations. Uh, that we're bringing to the world through these virtual programs. So thank you, Tony. We didn't pay you for that comment, but <laughs> we really do very really much appreciate it. And we are definitely planning on continuing these virtual conversations once the galleries open its doors again on Friday. This is um, it's now become one of our bedrocks, I suppose, is uh, committing ourselves to bringing these virtual programs out to Australia and to the world. So thank you so much, Sandra and Rebecca, for such an interesting conversation today. We've touched on so many different areas, but I really love the focus on um, Indigenous members of our collection who have actually really pushed boundaries in terms of the arts. And it was such a lovely reflection that you had earlier on, Rebecca, about people paving the way for yourself and your career as well. And that's always that personal um, connection to the people in our collection was such a lovely thing to hear you share. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, we thank never you. do anything alone. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. And I, I'd like to again welcome Rebecca to the team. We're looking forward to working with her for a long time to come. Yeah, very happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so our virtual community will hear a lot more from Rebecca going forward, coming forward in the next uh, few years. So Thank you so much to both of you and, and thank you to everybody who was joining us today on Facebook and Zoom. We really appreciate you logging in and joining in the conversation and putting your observations and comments into the chat. If you'd like to catch up on all of the other things we've got coming forward, when we open on Friday, um, our exhibition that was abruptly cut short by our last lockdown, Living Memory, the National Photographic Portrait Prize, it's actually been extended until the 16th of January. but as well as that, we're also opening our call for entries to next year's National Photographic Portrait Prize this coming Monday. So all of the photographers out there who would like to submit their work for the National Photographic Portrait Prize next year, mark that date in your diaries and start getting those entries into us. But because we seem to have such a photography focus in the next month, the next few Thursdays in November, we are going to feature um, 
some discussions with photographers and specifically photographers who spent a lot of time working overseas. So we have John Siavis next Thursday, um, who uh, separates his time between Los Angeles and Mexico and Melbourne. And then we've also got coming up later in November, uh, a discussion with Nikki Tool, the wonderful Nikki Tool, who uh, left Australia um, at the beginning before COVID really hit with the idea of traveling around the world for one year and resettling back in Melbourne, but has been stuck in Paris ever since. So she's just decided to make that her home. You know, when the world gives you lemons, what do you do? So please join us for those conversations and also jump on our website to see all of the other great programs we've got coming up in the next couple of months. And we hope to see you all hopefully in the gallery if you can make it to Canberra. Otherwise, please join us back online. We love seeing all of your faces um, come to us each week through this virtual platform. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe. See you soon. Bye bye.